I want to welcome you all. Um, this is our second April activity, uh, sort of honoring and remembering, if you will, the 40th anniversary of services for students with disabilities. My name is Stuart Siegel, and I'm the director of the Office of Services for Students with Disabilities, and I'm glad you're here. So before I uh, introduce our wonderful guest, I just want to let you know that one of the, the ways that we're celebrating the 40th anniversary is that every month we're doing an activity, either a speaker or an event of some type, and I just wanted to make you aware of that, and I wanted to promote our May event, and because I wa was wanting to make sure that we included all of the campus, May's event will be on North Campus, because they're an important part of our campus and our campus partners as well. So next month we'll be hearing from two engineering fact faculty, David Chesney and Clive D'Souza, who will be speaking on disability-related issues and engineering. So I hope that you'll consider coming to that talk. Um, it is going to be on Thursday, May 15th at 10 o'clock in the morning, and will be in the Bob and Betty uh, Beister Building, room 1670. And there's actually flyers on the back that I hope you'll consider taking and passing out to friends, families, uh, neighbors, whoever because we do like to have a good turnout. And if you enjoyed the food, the food will be there as well. So, you know, come for the food, stay for the talk. Um, in addition, I just want to let you know that we will be doing an event a month. Some of the events that will be coming up in the near future, and you can sort of chime in, Jill, Mary, and Fred, if I forget something. We will have in one of our graduate students, Lloyd Sheldon, who will be giving a talk on the intersection between race and disability. I believe that's coming up in September. Uh, anything for? Uh, she will be here August 15th. And that talk will be both uh, Lloyd Sheldon's talk and the Spooner talk will be in this room. Bill Larson will be here in June to talk about mm -hmm. veterans and disabilities. Dr. Robert Ernst will be here in July. And talking about what, chronic health? Head injuries? Okay. And all of this is going to culminate, and this is sort of what I really hope that you'll consider, will culminate on an all-day conference in October, Friday, October 17th, and that's a free all-day conference. We're hoping to make it interesting and broad enough that uh, all the university community will consider coming. Here comes Lloyd Sheldon now. Lloyd, I just promoted your talk. Um, and uh, just to give you a taste of what that will be at that conference, we have four speakers lined up. Uh, we will be having John Grearden, who will be talking about uh, treatment of mood disorders, both in the past and in the future. We will be having um, either Jack Bernard or another faculty from the law school talking about the history of disability law. We will be having a, a speaker, uh, another speaker from engineering, who's the head of the um, driverless car project. And finally, we will be having a, a speaker from the School of Public Health, who will be speaking on the need and the value of purpose in life, and that he'll be our last speaker. So there will also be a free luncheon. The quality of food will again be as good as the quality of these snacks. So again, come for the food, stay for the talk. Now, it is my uh, privilege and honor to introduce to you uh, Dr. Dana Green. And Dana and I go back many, many years. I've been in this position. It will be 21 years this August. One of the first students I worked with 21 years ago was Dana Green, when Dana was a graduate student in sociology. And I was fortunate enough to sort of get to know her. I was actually at her oral defense and we have remained in contact throughout the years. So Dana is currently at the University of North Carolina in the Institute of Environmental, Institute for the Environment, for the Environment and has done most of her professional life in the South of North Carolina at various institutions. So she comes to us and the great thing is, is none of you know this, well you might know it, but SSD does not have a ton of money. So it would be hard pressed for us to bring somebody of her stature from the University of North Carolina 
and Dana has graciously come at her own expense to give this talk. So I'm very appreciative. She said all it would cost me is lunch at Red Hawk. So I will be taking her and her, and what, oh, and SSD swag. What's the third thing? Oh, and you've got water and coffee. <laughs> and she has brought her husband and service dog as well. So we'll be taking all of them out. Okay, without further ado, let me introduce you, Dana Green. Thanks, Stuart. Okay, um, can everybody hear me? Yep, okay. This is my service dog, Gobi. And I'll be getting to what he does and why he's here and all that. Uh, but if you notice, the uh, <coughs> latex balloons have been appropriately pushed back because I have an anaphylactic allergy to latex and they could kill me. So let's not go there. Um, I titled my talk today, Navigating Grad Graduate School and Beyond with a Learning and Medical Disability. And as I look out into the audience, there are several people here that I'd like to thank. Stuart is one of them. Gail Ness, who is the chair of the Department of Sociology, who actually admitted what they thought was the very first LD graduate student into the Department of Sociology. Um, and my dissertation chair, Max Tyrick, who's sitting in the back with my husband, who held my hand, invited me for tea, and said, you can do this. So between Gail and Max and Stuart, I have you know, really strong cheerleaders, and I'm eternally grateful. Um, when I first got accepted to the University of Michigan, it was in the School of Public Health. And I received a little handbook from Rackham that said, it was called Rounding Out A Squared. And they sent it to me at Davis, and I said, absolutely, what the heck is A Squared? <laughs> no clue what A Squared was. Read all the way through the booklet. A Squared is not defined. It's not in the, um, in the glossary anywhere. No clue. So one of my very first questions to Gail was, what in the world is A Squared? To which she laughed and said, it's just Ann Arbor, Dana. Don't worry. Um, so when I first started coming, when I first said I was going to come to um, Michigan, I started off in the School of Public Health and fe really felt that, that was a really bad decision for me and made the transition over to sociology. And as I moved from the medical campus down here to main campus, I really realized that I wasn't in San Francisco anymore. That while Berkeley was what I was accustomed to, I was told that Ann Arbor was the Berkeley of the Midwest, and it really wasn't in many ways. I was looking for the homeless people. I was looking for the BART stations. I was looking for um, the really strong diversity. And I didn't see as much as I really wanted to see. And in fact, I felt a little bit out of place. The other thing that, that kept me out of place was you know, fears of not being able to keep up in school, coupled with, oh my god, it's cold here. <laughs> and something that was said in my orientation. Well, in my orientation, Gail said to my cohort of 40, because we had the world's largest cohort by accident, if that's correct, he said, look to your left and look to your right. Remember this? One or the other will not be here when you graduate. Okay? They won't make it through the program. And all of a sudden, I was freaked. I'm like, I was confused. Because I thought be me. Right? I have a learning disability. I have, you know, dyslexia. I have dyscalculia. I can't keep up. Oh, my God. And then Gail says to me, you have to pass a very set, quantitative set, set of courses. So sh what, is, what was then, I don't know if it's still, so 510, which was basic stats. So 610, which was more advanced stats. And then some, a couple more advanced statistics courses. And he emphasized to me that this is a very quantitative program. And that if I wanted to stay in this program and get a PhD, I had to really work hard. Remember all this? OK. <laughs> oh my god, what am I going to do? Right? So I'm not going to let Gail see me sweat. I decide. I'm going to go find Stuart, OK? I really want the PhD. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm used to getting straight A's in college. All of a sudden, can a student with a documented learning disability really get a PhD? Is it possible? Obviously, Gail thought I could, or you wouldn't have admitted me. But I'm, I'm freaking out. Who do I disclose to? How do I tell people? What do I do? 
And Stuart helped me sort out how to approach professors. But it was a very rocky path. And this is where my dissertation chair, Max, came in. Because it was a rocky path because I didn't want to be seen as an affirmative action case. But at the same time, I wanted to be seen as like, just like everybody else. I didn't want to be seen as different. So how do I get accommodations like books on tape or two days to take my prelims as opposed to one? Um, and Gail very nicely gave me his office for two days. And I sat there for eight hours a day typing out my um, preliminary um, exam answers. And then only for Jeff Page, one of my readers, to say to me at the very end, you passed, but we have one question for you, and that is, are you literate? Um, because apparently I forgot to spell check on my last answer. Um, but securing accommodations, like getting books on tape, um, having a note taker, um, being able to record lectures, working with Yushia, who taught the advanced statistics course, really helped me to get a little bit more confidence. But for a while there, it was almost as though my being LD was the way people saw me, as opposed to my being an actual human being. And that, that to me, was always a problem. So my, my goal was learning to manage the demands of graduate school with dyslexia and dyscalculia. So I really wanted to find a home in sociology. Um, I really wanted to come out of the closet as an LD student. And I did that fairly quickly. But then I learned that there were a couple of things that I had to really focus on, a couple of things that were key. The first thing was time management. If I wanted to keep up with the regular course load, because I refused, as Stuart can attest, to take a lightened course load, um, I absolutely refused. I wanted to be just like everyone else. So I took two courses a semester and taught. Um, I had to learn how to manage my time. And that meant that I would be up really, really late and get up really, really early and get all of my work done so that I could be in the classroom teaching. And that was fun and it was interesting, but it was hard. And the other way that I had to do this was to implement new accommodations. And Stuart really helped me at that point by helping me find gels to put over some of what I was reading so that I wouldn't reverse letters or numbers in the same way. And we learned that orange was really my color. I now have an aversion to orange <laughs> um, that developed after graduate school. Um, I can't really wear orange clothing. really don't want to see another orange highlighter. Um, but the good news is I can now touch my dissertation again. Um, so, and then I had to really define my space and my purpose. Who did I want to be seen as? How did I want to be defined? What did I want to do? Did I want to be seen as the disabled, the LD student? Or did I want to be some, seen as just like any other student? Well, the Department of Sociology, while I was there, had all kinds of issues happening all at the same time. And from what I understand, that's pretty par for the course for any sociology department, because we're teaching students to be progressive, we're teaching students to be radical, we're teaching students to really think for themselves, to go out and make social change, right? And what I hadn't expected was there to be a bifurcation of the student body while I was on, on campus. And that was really kind of freaky. Um, so what I really tried to do was to define my own space and my own purpose, learn to keep to myself and get my work done, and get it all done as well as possible. Now, I was afraid that I was going to flunk out of my coursework. That didn't happen because with proper planning with Gail, I managed to map out my first two years, and I stuck to it, every single class. And I listened to the people who were advising me as I came into the program. Prelims were a scary prospect. How many of you guys all know what, pre what prelims are? A couple, OK? Gail knows. You wrote some of the questions. <laughs> uh, in fact, I think you wrote the GDP question that I had to answer. Um, but prelims are the qualifying exams for the PhD. And I had a list of 113 books, articles, et cetera, that I had to read, digest, remember, synthesize. And then I had to answer four questions, four essay questions. Two, it was a normal person would do two in the morning, two in the afternoon. I did one in the morning, one in the afternoon on a Friday, one in the morning, one in the afternoon on a Saturday. Okay. 
And I didn't know what my questions were going to be, but I could see previous exams. I stressed out over prelims. I was so stressed over prelims that I didn't know what I was doing because my notes became all convoluted. And I had to start thinking about it as you know, individual file folders in my head, right? And I remember different questions, and you could tell which faculty members asked which questions based upon the wording, based upon the, um, the various different kinds of things that they were asking you to do. And my favorite question that I remember to this day, because I promised myself I would never write an exam question quite like this, <laughs> was um, the wall was crumbling in Germany. The, there's genocide happening in Serbia. And the world fears Turkish involvement. Use all of the theories of nationalism to explain this phenomenon. To which I went, oh my god. All of the theories of nationalism? I only knew 17. <laughs> OK? I only knew 17. What was I supposed to do? I was panicking. Because the, uh, the other question was a demographic question that I didn't want to touch with a 10-foot foot, foot pole. So it's like, OK, if I fail my prelims, I can always retake them once. You get one additional chance. Like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. OK, I can do this, right? So I managed to pass my prelims and pass my GDP question, um, which always seems to be on the social org prelim. And that was the biggest thing for me. That was the, one of the biggest hurdles. Because once I got to the prelim, I thought, wow, you know, I really do have a foundation in so sociology. I can write my perspective. Now, I'm one of those crazy graduate students who started off with a um, dissertation topic on Egypt. I went to Egypt, spent several months there, learned to speak the language, wrote a full perspective, got kicked out by the State Department because of the Gulf War, and had to come back and redefine myself again. And so my perspective was um, directed by Max Hyrick and ended up being a study on Jewish American identity. Um, and my very strong interest is on disasters. So I was looking at the Holocaust as a technological disaster and looking at the various forms of identity formation that came about through literature. So again, I had to be creative in how I did this, but I created my own data source, my own database, and ultimately, and it took a couple of years, lots and lots of midnight trips to Max's house to deliver chapters into a metal box, um, trips to St. Joe's um, ICU with chapters and red pens to deliver you stuff to read because you were bored. Um, and I made it through the dissertation. Oh my god, they actually gave me a PhD. So I have some of my cheerleaders up here. There's Max Heyrich, Gail Ness, Renee Onsbach, Mark Chesler, Stuart Siegel, Todd Endelman, Al Young, and Mayor Zalt. Okay? These were some of my departmental cheerleaders. These were the people that were standing behind me the entire way, saying, you can do this. And I'd really thought about bringing pom-poms with me and handing them out <laughs> to each of you. Uh, because these were the folks who really said, you know, it doesn't matter what people are saying about you. It doesn't matter what people think about you. You're capable. And in fact, Renee Onspach actually said to me, she goes, you know, you really are very smart. <laughs> and despite having a learning disability, I was like, thanks. You know, because people with learning differences tend to be a, of above average intelligence generally. Einstein had a learning disability, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. So I'm indebted to these individuals, and I'm so glad that two are here. Um, so in May 2000, I got my PhD. And I wanted to have the tune, you know, I want my MTV, I got my PhD. Um, <laughs> but I couldn't figure out quite how to do this. But I had to navigate the job market. And looking for my first academic job was difficult. Because I had to make a decision. Did I want to disclose having a disability or not? And cho I chose not to. Because the, the types of institutions that I was looking at were predominantly liberal arts schools. I was looking at smaller schools where I could teach small classes. Um, I went to various different campus visits, gave job talks that were 
specific to that institution. So I was constantly writing different job talks. Um, and my teaching philosophies became really well defined for me. I taught all the way through my time here at Michigan, but I also was really into focusing on the student, knowing the student, and not wanting to teach 600 person courses anymore. For me, a quality education meant what I got in graduate school, which was people who knew me, people who could say, hey, look, you're looking stressed. Can I help you in any way, shape, or form? And Max was wonderful. He hadn't heard from me in three weeks. I got a phone call. Come to see at my house, please. <coughs> I want to talk to you about what's going on in your latest whatever. Um, so I began to refine my CV. I went to more and more academic conferences and worked on really becoming <laughs> a, uh, he's sleeping down here, um, a professional academic. I didn't really know what it meant. I thought once I got through graduate school, the workload would decrease once I got on the tenure track. <laughs> Very funny, right? No, it increases. So it increases when you go from college to the master's level. You pass your prelim, it increases 12-fold there. Then when you get on the academic um, job market, it's, you know, there's this misnomer that, yes, you can, it's actually going to be okay. You get into your first job, it's like, holy cow. I have to teach three courses, the three of which are new prep. I have to sit on committees. I have to advise students. I have to reach, uh, run, read, do research, publish, 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 or perish, right? And I was like, oh my god. And the fa I was accountable also to the faculty and to the students. Oh my god. You know, everybody was looking at this. So becoming a professional academic was a huge transition for me. My first academic um, post was at Wake Forest University. And I took a two-year te um, temporary position and was very grateful that I had taught my way through graduate school, that I'd been a graduate GSI, um, that I'd been able to learn how to teach. And I had those small classes, and that was wonderful. What was really difficult was sitting on six or seven committees, having to do all the service, and then basically being in my office as a junior faculty member until 8 or 9 o'clock at night, every single night. Because again, everything took a little bit more time for me to do. So I, the slower, what somebody could do in two hours, would take me six. So I worked and I worked and I worked, but I figured that that was the way that I would you know, acclimate, if you will, to becoming a professional academic and keeping my disability hidden. But then a monkey wrench got thrown into the picture. I was diagnosed with a life-threatening chronic illness in June of 2000. Um, I have a nice picture of the steps or of the, um, the uh, University of Michigan Hospital here. And right about here is where I collapsed. I collapsed, in the, you know, basically on the entrance to the University Hospital. I didn't make it into the hospital itself. And I was hospitalized. I thought I was dying. The nurses came in and said, you've got terminal ileitis. I went, what? And they kept repeating terminal ileitis. They didn't tell me that Crohn's disease meant terminal ileitis means that the terminal part of the ileum is what is affected and that you're not going to die. Okay? So I'm sitting there going, terminal, 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 terminal. Oh my God, what am I doing? Right? I don't know what to do. I had been getting sick every three months all the way through graduate school, all the way through college. Didn't know what it was. Um, we won't go into the fact that my mom knew and never told me, um, but I thought I was dying. I was seriously thinking that I was dying. And at that point, I called Max and I said, I don't know what to do. I'm not getting any answers. So he calls the floor nurses and he says, I need to speak with Dr. Green. All of a sudden, the attendings arrived. <laughs> All of the other you know, nurses were there and they began to explain to me that I wasn't dying, that it was just the end part of the ileum, that I was actually going to be okay as long as I took the meds. So as I've adjusted, I had to take 56 different pills just to get into remission. Okay? 
Again, I decided not to disclose this to my new employer because if I disclose this, would they think differently of me? Would they think that I couldn't do the job? What would happen? I had to find a way to compensate. And again, I didn't want to be judged. So how do you make this, how do you turn around a learning disability plus a medical disability and make it a positive thing? How do you do it? Can you do it? Well, can I be an academic with Crohn's disease? Yes. I definitely can be an, ac you know, an academic with Crohn's disease. Um, and I chose to disclose only when I absolutely had to. But I found that if I kept my meds on schedule, which was very hard to do because I was becoming more and more the absent-minded professor, um, I had to deal with some of the complications. And Crohn's disease really likes me. I mean, it really, really likes me. As much as I dislike it, it likes me. And it has caused me to have to change the way that I think about my career, the way that I think about what I do in my life, and the way that I interact with other scholars. So I had double jeopardy. Um, I had a learning disability and a medical disability. And I had sheer determination. I'm a Michigan PhD. I can do anything, right? Because that's what we're taught. Here at Michigan, you can do anything. If you get a Michigan PhD, you are expected to be a superstar, right? And I'm going to be that superstar. I'm determined to be that superstar. So going back to teaching service to the department, university, and community, and getting into that publisher parish mode, I found that I was loving the thrill of the hunt. I loved the research. I loved the writing. I was putting out article after article after article after article. But what was suffering was my teaching because I couldn't stay out of the bathroom. And that was a problem. That was a problem. So I'm not necessarily Wonder Woman. OK. I can give that up. I don't need to wear the fancy costume. Um, the learning disability can be hidden, but the medical disability really couldn't. And my physician ended up putting me out on disability, which was really kind of infuriating. Um, she said that I couldn't teach in the classroom any longer because the Crohn's was getting to be so bad that I was taking meds five times a day and I couldn't guarantee that I could be in a classroom, a traditional classroom, two days a week or three days a week on a specific schedule. And this was hard. So I had to redefine my career again. I opted to leave the tenure track. And I redefined my career and my extracurricular activities in such a way as to accommodate my medical restrictions. Right? I did what I love. Research, grant writing, 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 research, 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 swimming, research, 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 swimming. This is kind of what I did. And yet, people kept saying, well, you're disabled. You're disabled. You're disabled. You're on disability. And I refused to accept that. I don't want to be seen as disabled. I want to be seen as differently abled. I made a conscious choice to leave the tenure track, to redefine my career as research only, which actually is very much in line with the Michigan philosophy. Do research, do research, do research, do research. I focused, my focus shifted to field work, grant writing, paper writing, book proposals, publishing, publishing, publishing. And in the last year, I got eight papers accepted for publication three book chapters, and I've got a book proposal in one year. So I'm loving what I'm doing. I'm working slowly when I need to work slowly. I'm working more quickly when I can work quickly. And it doesn't matter because I can work from pretty much anywhere. <laughs> OK? Um, when I became a research fellow, it meant that I could work anywhere. I have an office at UNC. My productivity increased when I stopped teaching. It absolutely increased. And yes, I will tell you honestly, I do miss my students. But I do get asked to be on dissertation committees. I do work with students on projects. So I do have some student you know, connection. But really, my goal was I needed to find a way to become an academic to stay away from being seen as disabled and to really realize that my learning disabilities didn't matter because I can work at my own pace 
My medical disability didn't matter because I could work from anywhere, and I did really and truly set up a bathroom office. Um, I have a little phone in there um, with a charger. I have a computer desk, and my little laptop can go pretty much anywhere. Um, so it does actually work. Um, I won't tell you which papers were written where, <laughs> but um, it does. Um, it does help. And I set my own goals and my own boundaries. There are times when I will say to folks, look, I cannot take on any more work. And there are times when I'll say, this is a really exciting project, a really exciting prospect. I'd love to get involved in X, Y, or Z component of it. And that's how I've gotten, uh, how I've stayed active. And I'm working with faculty members from Michigan, from Oklahoma State, from Montana State, from Berkeley, um, to on different projects. I have right now about 11 concurrent projects. Um, Crohn's disease continues to try to kill me. I refuse to try to, to let it. But there are times when you just kind of want to say, what in the world? I can only take so much, right? My body can only take so much. And there are times when I'm just like, okay, what do I do? How do I cope with this? How do I do this? So I surround myself with the support of colleagues, family, friends, and I just continue to work my little crony butt off. Because my goal is not to let people see me sweat, but to accommodate the disabilities in such a way as to make them positive, not negative. So eliminating teaching is really hard. It was really hard for me because I did love it. But research, writing, and competitive swimming became my new normal. Um, while I was here, I swam masters. But returning to competitive swimming full time has, it keeps me healthier, it keeps me happy, and I qualified for world championships this year, so very exciting. And I, do my, I found that I do my best writing and my best data analysis underwater. You know, nobody can, nobody can bother me. I can swim, and I don't even stop, and I'm swimming and swimming and swimming and swimming, and all of a sudden I figure it out. This is what I need to say in my next paper, or this is how I need to work out this analysis. My heavy training schedule helps keep me on par for managing my workload. Because if I'm doing two-a-days, swimming in the morning, swimming in the evening, I have to get the rest of my work done in between those hours, right? Um, I'm extremely happy. I don't take on projects that I don't want to work on. It's a real luxury that having a PhD from Michigan can offer me. And Training with a medical disability creates new and unique issues because I'm always in severe pain. And so I have several coaches that I work with. Um, Misty Hyman, who is a um, gold medal butterflyer, and Enie Jones, who made the 1980 uh, Olympic team, but obviously did not get to compete because we boycotted those games, um, have been working with me very closely to refine strokes so that I can actually do them legally, not get disqualified, and not have as much pain. And one of the things is, I'm a butterfly. And if you do a butterfly stroke, you kind of, you're going out like this, right? Well, if you're moving your body back and forth like this, that hurts a lot if you've got Crohn's disease. So I, we're trying to refine the stroke ever so slightly so that I'm still using a forward motion, but I'm not pushing on this part of my body. And so far, I have not been disqualified in national competition, international competition, or even in just regular meets. So keeping my fingers crossed that in Montreal this year, at Worlds, what Misty Hyman has taught me will work, right? But accommodating the disease while training hard can often be hard because I can't take medications that would normally make you sleepy. My physician said, well, why don't you just take a quarter of an oxycodone before you go to practice? <laughs> yeah, a quarter of an oxycodone. Right. That's a good way to make me go. And then poor Gobi would have to go into the water and get me. So there have to be other ways of, of accommodating this. So I have new cheerleaders as well. Up in the far um, corner up here is Enie Jones from the 1980 um, Olympic team. You can't really tell. She's a mountain mermaid now. Misty Hyman. 
my father, Lori Peak from Colorado State, Danielle Hidalgo from UCSB. That's my husband. He wouldn't give me a better picture, so I threatened <laughs> to use that one. Meredith Novak, who just swam the uh, Hawaii uh, Channel twice. She was the first woman ever to do so, from Maui to uh, Lanai and back, without a wetsuit, without a shark cage, without a wetsuit. And my friend Kathy Morris, who, when I collapsed on the steps of the Michigan Hospital, came running to me and gave me a pile of People magazines. I now have a lifetime subscription to People, thanks to, to Kathy. So these are folks that have joined my academic cheerleaders as being my cheerleaders, um, being my coaches, people who push me forward and keep encouraging me to not let the disabilities be disabilities, but let them be different abilities. So the plot thickens. As my health deteriorates, I end up having to make a choice. And this is Gobi at um, Omaha right after Olympic trials. I was told by my doctors that I could either live in a bubble or I could get a service dog. And the reason for this was, yes, I know I said your name, um, that I'd been in and out of hospital so much and been swimming so much that I developed an anaphylactic allergy to latex. Coming into contact with latex will kill me. If I touch it, if a balloon breaks, if there's the powder, Stuart's looking at the balloon, <laughs> um, if I eat an avocado, which has latex properties, use something that has aloe, shea butter, eat kiwi, any of these things cross-react with latex. And so I had a choice. I could live in a bubble, stop swimming, stop interacting with humans, live in my house, never leave. That doesn't sound very exciting, does it? Or I had the choice to get the world's smallest, whoops, service animal known to man, known as a goby, um, or his first name was Leon when I first met him. Um, okay, so goby was recommended by both my gastroenterologist and my, um, and my primary care physician, and they put their heads together, wrote a prescription for a service dog. Well, I'm a smart ass enough to say, okay, I've got 58 other prescriptions. Might as well turn this prescription into Target Pharmacy and see what they have to say. So I turned in my prescription for a service dog. Next thing I hear over the, over the intercom is, uh, Dana, get your butt back to the pharmacy. We can't do this. You know this. Um, but I was just trying to be funny, right? I wanted to you know, get them laughing with me. And it ended up being that Blue Cross Blue Shield of, no of North Carolina would cover Gobi in full. All of his training, all of his food, all of his medical maintenance, everything, 100%. For me, it was only 80%. What the heck, <laughs> right? But he has really become my, my little savior. He goes everywhere with me. He tells me what's safe, what's not safe. Um, he jumps into the water <coughs> if there's a problem. Um, and very recently, one of my teammates, actually, um, our former team captain, put on a brand new latex cap right next to Gobi. Gobi jumped out of his little box, dialed 911 on his cell phone. He's got his very own iPhone 4 um, and was in the water. We were swimming butterfly at 50 meters. I was 50 meters out, so I was fine because it's usually 10 feet around Gobi. Um, but I look up and all of a sudden I see my chihuahua in his full gear swimming towards me with an EpiPen in his mouth. Okay, I start laughing. By the time I reach the, the end of the pool, EMS is there. I'm just sitting there going, this didn't really happen, right? Oh, yes, it did. In fact, my team will not let me forget it. So I, the choice that I made is obvious. I, I made the choice to get a Gobi. And Gobi made things very different, difficult, and very, very different for me. And basically, navigating the world with different abilities and with a service dog created some new challenges. And <coughs> Mark Middleton, from Growing Boulder, um, decided to do a story on Gobi. So let's see if I can get this to work. Cannot locate. Does this work? It says, cannot locate the internet server or proxy server. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't know how to do that. 
See if this works. Let's have the good side. Okay, let's see if this works. Should work. And this has volume on it. Okay. <coughs> Mark Middleton decided to name Dobie the Wonder Dog and did this piece on him. The Rowdy Games Masters Classic features swimmers from all around the world of all ages and abilities. Past and current Olympians, 85-year-old superstars. In a pool filled with inspirational stories, we found someone who really is growing bolder. Dana Green is a disaster sociologist from the University of North Carolina. The truth is, she's never far from a potential disaster herself. Well, I have a very severe anaphylactic allergy to latex, and because of that, my physician said, um, I either have to live in a bubble or get a service dog that could sniff out latex. Fortunately, she's got Gobi, the six-pound wonder dog. Gobi's a highly trained service dog who's always scanning for anything that could cause a life-threatening allergic reaction. Yesterday, I got pinned to a wall in, a, in an elevator because there were latex gloves on a housekeeping person at our hotel. But that's nothing compared to what Gobi is trained to do at a swimming meet where he's always on alert. When Dana swims, she positions Gobi near her lane in a small mesh kennel. Inside the kennel, she places her inhaler, an EpiPen, an epinephrine injector to treat allergic reactions, and her cell phone. He knows he can swipe and then hit this bottom left button. It goes directly to 911. If 911 gets a call, from a dog and dog barks twice, they know to use the GPS locator to find the person to whom the phone belongs. And he has done this twice while I've been in the water, and both times were warranted, where he's called 911, grabbed this in his mouth, and gotten into the water after me. Wow. Hopefully that won't happen today. While Gobi stands by ready to do his thing, Dana prepares to do hers. Are you nervous? No, just excited. I haven't swum in a very long time. One final instruction for Gobi the Wonder Dog, and it's go time. While Dana swims, Gobi scans. Fortunately, today is not a day that he has to spring into action, but the fact that he can and will gives Dana the freedom to not only live a fairly normal life, but to continue growing bolder, to hold down a great job, to help others, and to compete in the sport that she loves. We're inseparable. We're inseparable. Um, I feel naked when he's not around. I mean, I don't even see him as a, you know, a separate entity. He's like part of me now. He's my little savior. I feel very blessed that I have him. So basically that was something that was a bit of a surprise. I didn't know that that was going to be done until the very end of the Rowdy Games meet. Um, but people were asking all kinds of questions and they wanted to put it out there as to, you know, what can a dog like a Chihuahua do? I mean, Chihuahua service dog, really? Um, and I, I, navigating the world with different abilities and uh, a service dog often leads people to ask questions or make assumptions that <coughs> aren't often correct, if you will. Um, for example, I just flew to Montana for the Equal Page Summit featuring um, Lily Ledbetter, and I was giving two talks there. And as I got off the plane, I was flying on my mother's miles, which was mistake number one. Um, <coughs> but <coughs> she only flies United, I only fly Delta. 
And so she informed the folks at United that I would be traveling with a service dog. Well, I get off the plane, and there is a gentleman waiting there with a big sign, big sign, with my name in like huge letters. This, each letter was like this big, <coughs> so that I could be sure to see it, I'm sure. And he says, ma'am, I'm here to help you to your next gate. And he proceeds by taking my elbow and says, follow your chihuahua service dog, your seeing eye dog, and he'll get you to the right gate. And I'm just sitting there going, do I correct this guy? Or do I let him go on thinking that Gobi is my seeing eye dog? Sorry, Gobi. Um, I was really, this was a lot of inner turmoil. I wasn't quite sure what to do. So finally I told him, I said, I can speak. He said, yeah, but apparently not very well. You have a service animal. And I'm like, okay. <coughs> there are just some people you just don't educate, right? I figured what the heck. So I get on the plane, and this gentleman follows me on the plane. And he puts my bag overhead because he claims that I can't see the overhead compartment. And so I pull out my book that I'm reading, okay? And <clears throat> he then goes to the flight attendant and says, person sitting in row in seat 5A, she's blind, um, so take special care of her. And I'm sitting there going, great. I've got my book out, I've got a highlighter, I've got sticky notes, <coughs> and my pen. And Gobi, at this point, has gone to sleep. <laughs> and I'm sitting there thinking, OK. I, don't, I didn't know what to do. And you know, so I kind of let him think what he wanted to think, right? At that point, he, even though I told him I could see, he made the assumption that I couldn't. While I was on the plane, I had somebody else come up to me, one of the flight attendants, and they were signing to me. <laughs> right. They were signing to me. I know sign language, and I signed back. I thought they were deaf. But apparently, they weren't deaf either. OK? So there was all these misconceptions that go on. People make assumptions. But when you have a service dog that's this size, is it going to be able to turn on a light bulb? Is he going to be able to pick up a book that I dropped? No. A pen, maybe. A book, no. He's great at alerting for medical issues, but he's not a seeing eye chihuahua. <laughs> and he's certainly, I don't, I mean, he's got very big ears, but that doesn't mean that I can't hear. So the assumptions were really crazy. And a lot of people are like, oh my god, a chihuahua service dog, really? Or as I'm in Target a lot, I very rarely put him in a, in a basket, but he usually walks with me. All of a sudden, I'll hear a lot of kids going, oh my god, there's a dog in Target. And I'll look around and go, where? <laughs> you know? Because I'm not used to it. But the reality of it is that having Gobi with me means that he's just keeping me safe from things that could potentially harm me. It doesn't mean that I have other labels on me that people want to place on me. And that's a sociological phenomenon in and of itself. So, you know, the Michigan champion, uh, the Michigan motto here is those who stay will be champions, right? And being trained in the Michigan tradition really means, for me at least, maintaining a strong research agenda and a high level of productivity. I'm doing that. And I'm so proud to be a Michigan alum. I'm so proud that Gail saw to accept me into the program. I am so glad that when I looked to my right and to my left, that it was me that actually made it through. Barely, by the skin of my teeth. But I made it. I made it. Um, I passed my prelims, barely. But I made it. Um, I had the best mentors possible, and I'm eternally grateful. And it's, I'm so excited that Gail is here and Max is here. I mean, this is, this is terrific for me. Um, and my training, plus the mentoring that I received, made it possible for me to really redefine and stay true to the, the research agenda and the person that I want to be in spite of double jeopardy, a learning disability or a medical disability. So in sum, I couldn't be happier. I have the best of all worlds, right? I can work hard. I have a strong research agenda. I have fun writing projects. I've got awesome health care, tremendous mentors from both U of M and beyond, um, terrific support, an awesome service done. 
So it can be done. You can live with a learning disability and a medical disability and get a PhD and be productive, right? It can be done. And for those who say that it can't, you're at the wrong school because at Michigan, it can't. So, any questions, comments? I used the same picture that uh, was used by SSD, and this was me after I swam in an alligator-infested lake. Um, it was Lucky's Lake Swim. I was very excited. Um, I just swam the Tiburon Mile from Angel Island to uh, downtown Tiburon, what, one nautical mile without a wetsuit. Um, and so this was Lucky's Lake Swim, um, and uh, yeah, there's a fake alligator that I'm standing next to. Nobody told me that the alligators were actually in the lake, but I should have <laughs> known it um, until after I finished the swim. Um, but thankfully, uh, I made it through. And that's been the goal. So making it through, continuing the research agenda, um, getting papers into ASA journals, um, publishing book chapters, working hard despite having a learning disability and a medical disability and it can be done, and I'm living proof. So, thank you. <laughs> Any questions, comments? Yes, ma'am. I wanted to thank you for an absolutely marvelous presentation. I mean, I'm just overwhelmed on so many levels. You, you, you offered so much. It's just wonderful. And um, I guess that's my statement. You know, as they say, that's my statement, and here's my question. Um, so my question is, in addition to the wonderful internal motivation and the marvelous champions that you have, some of whom are right here in the audience, do you attribute anything at all to luck, you know, just the luck of the draw? Um, in a sense, yes, I was lucky that uh, <clears throat> when I realized that public health wasn't for me, that there happened to be a sociologist in the School of Public Health that I could talk to. And that was, that, that was luck of the draw, finding Dale. So, yes. Yes, Gail. Well, I, I just realized now that you, Max, and I have something else in common. We were all Berkeley students. Oh. And, came here. and here's, here's an institutional observation that I think you'll, you'll react very well to. Um, when I was at Berkeley, I was one of 200 graduate students there. Uh, the professors all had private offices without their names on the door. You only went to the see them if you were invited. And of those 200 graduate students, there were three fellowships. I came to Michigan, and we had 200 graduate students. All of them were supported. The faculty had gone out and entrepreneur uh, research grants, training grants, and so on to support all the students. And I, I came in 1964. This is my 50th year on campus. And, uh, Al Reese, our chairman, called us into the office. We were 13 new assistant professors appointed that year. And he said, uh, you can all make tenure here. There are no quotas. You've got to do a few things. You've got to publish. That's absolutely important, he said. You don't have to be a great teacher, but you may not be a bad teacher. <laughs> the, the department placed emphasis on, on teaching. So we, we had a group of people who were attuned and saying, you know, the, the most wonderful thing I find when I'm growing old is to remember that there were young graduate students who were wet behind the ears and struggling and struggling and struggling. And now they've matured into the most wonderful people and mature, productive scholars and so on. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Because without you, I wouldn't have been here. Oh, yes, you would have been here. <laughs> I was that determined. <laughs> Well, I tried, I tried. Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you for speaking. Um, I'm curious to know, when you were in grad school, um, in terms of negotiating accommodations, um, I know for myself, sometimes it's hard to, not sometimes, I pretty much never ask unless something is offered to me. And I'm just wondering, how did you sort of get around that? Did you find yourself ever proactively asking for extra whatever, or for this or for that? Um, I, I never asked for anything extra. What I did do was before each class started, and this was on the recommendation of both Max and Gail, I would go to the professor and talk with them privately. Um, so 
I spoke with Renee Armstock before I took her theory course. And at the end of the theory course, she pulled me aside and she said, you know, you really are very smart. And I was like, wow, okay, cool. And then um, for, I knew for statistics because I had this calculus that I would need additional time. And so what I did was for 610, which was advanced statistics, I went to Yushia, who was the professor at the time, and he's a very nice man. Um, and I said to him, I understand statistics, but I sometimes reverse numbers. I'd like to be able to work a little bit more slowly through your exam. Is it possible for me to take some additional time during the exam? And he said to me, now I can quote him, absolutely that is not a problem, but just remember, I will work you hard, but I will not be your friend. Okay? He worked me hard. I was cool with that. And we have a very friendly relationship um, because he respected the work that I did. And it was, it was one of those things where I could show him that I knew what I was doing. Um, I just needed just a little bit more time. Um, in terms of, there were times when I had such a high reading load that Max, when you, I think you were undergraduate advisor at the time, helped me get uh, books on tape through um, Books for the Blind. And that really helped in terms of keeping up with the reading load because I could listen to them, take notes, and follow along with the book that I actually had. And that helped a lot too. Yes, sir. Question was what again? I'm sorry. It was about the experience. How would you like define that parameter? Like, how much is that important when you're applying to PhD? I think it's very important. And one of the key things that I would ask any graduate student um, in a graduate in a PhD program is, you know, are you are you comfortable here? Do you like it here? And do you have faculty mentorship? Because in the Department of Sociology, there there were faculty that were very easily accessible, and then there were faculty that were less accessible. Um, and it depends on what your area is. So you really have to, it's a very individual process. And so if you have a you know, some sort of disability, you want to make sure that you're in a department that is going to be as accessible to you for what you want. And your second question? The ranking of the university? As in, uh, there is one, say, say Caltech, it's like ranked really high. And the least says, uh, University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. So the professor with whom you are working is really good. And you know, like, this is the best fit for you. But you also get, uh, get the admit from Caltech. So in that case, it's a kind of tricky situation. Okay. Um, I mean, again, for me, the way that I look at things is it's not necessarily the prestige of the university as much as it is the fit of the program. Um, you know, I came from Michigan. Michigan ha opens a lot of doors. The, a PhD from Michigan opens a lot of doors. Um, but, you know, Caltech is also a very well-known school. It's not a Michigan, but it's very highly regarded. The question is, where do you feel most comfortable and so that's not a question that I can answer for you. It's a question that you have to look at and say, okay, I want to focus here and there's some faculty members here that I'm, I'm comfortable working with. And I've contacted these faculty members and they're willing to work with me. That's gonna be more important than really where you are physically. Um, and the one thing I can tell you is that when I came out to visit Michigan, um, in March of 1991, I can say, tell you honestly that Michigan lied. It was sunny. It was 78 <laughs> degrees. I walked around. I got a sunburn. I thought, this California kid can do this. 
On October 4th, 1991, at exactly 10.04 a.m., I was walking by the Todman Library and experienced wind chill for the first time. Um, I know, I looked at my clock and I remember it because it hurt. It felt like my, my skin was being stretched in half. And at that point, I was like, oh my God, I'm not in San Francisco anymore. Can you talk a little bit about, more about disclosure? Because I've been sort of weighing the pros and cons <laughs> of disclosure. Um, first, I'm realizing that there are far more people who have their own um, conditions and are keeping it to themselves for, for a variety of reasons. And I wonder, if maybe if I'm more open, it'll help them sort of feel more comfortable with them. Um, like so, I'm, like, and, and maybe that's a pro for our department, you know, culture, culture-wise. So I'm thinking, is that a pro if people are more open? Will that improve the culture of my department? Um, and then cons, if I um, if I keep it to myself and only wait until, like, if I only disclose when it's absolutely necessary, if I only disclose when I require an extension, if I only disclose if I if I can't work on a prog on a project, um, or uh, uh, or if I only disclose, uh, or uh, you know, when I only disclose when necessary, uh, or you know, those kinds of cons, um, and uh, the kind, and and I worry also about the the other consequences of disclosure. Will I get passed over for projects because people will 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 assume that I'm not going to be able to contribute to the extent that another student is able to, to contribute? Um, I don't know. Um, can you talk more about how you? Um, made, um, how you can, who to disclose to, um, and whether the department is amenable to that. Um, disclosure is really a personal thing. I elected to disclose to the graduate chair and to the chair of my department and to the faculty um, in whose courses I was, I was taking. I didn't make it a public thing initially among graduate students. Um, and I really felt like I, I needed to prove myself before I let, it, let the cat out of the bag. But honestly, I mean, it's a very personal thing. Um, if you think that you're going to get passed over because somebody's going to see you as disabled, then is that a department that you really want to be in? That's the first question. Um, I was fortunate. Um, people saw me as, as capable because I proved myself as capable, okay? I was able to teach most semesters that I was in school. Um, it's, it's really hard. I mean, there are a lot of times when I come into Stuart's office nearly in tears or in tears and saying, okay, can I really do this? And Stuart would be like, you can do this. You can do this. You've got this. Um, sometimes it helps to disclose to a peer especially if you're working like on a stats project, like our, our 610 projects would be 40 pages of statistics that we each had to turn in. Um, so we would work together, break it up. Um, and so I would disclose to my, my friends in my study group and say, hey, look, you know, I've got this problem. It makes me work a little bit slower. And they were all very willing to work with me in that regard. Um, so you have to be you know, pretty good judges of character and judge of the, of the people that you're working with. Now, legally, people can't discriminate against you. But we all know that what's legal and what actually happens can be two separate things, right? I haven't faced discrimination on the basis of being disabled um, or differently abled medically or because of a learning issue. But the way that I handle it is, hey, by the way, this is part of who I am, but it's not all of who I am. And that's how I did it. You know? So disclose what you feel is appropriate at the appropriate time, if that helps. I mean, I can't tell you, you know, talk to your chair today and then talk to your, your fellow students tomorrow. You know, every department is different. Every dynamic is different. You just have to gauge it for what's best for you. Yes. Your dyscalculia is perhaps not as severe as my son's. He's unable to read a clock and can't understand what a number is. Mm -hmm. So it's extremely severe. Um, and he has every cognitive learning disability in existence, all of them. Mm -hmm. 
Um, one of the things that we encounter is some people saying, yes, you can do it, but you have to maybe change what you're shooting for or do things a little differently. Mm -hmm. And then we hear from people who say, why are you even trying to go to college? Don't listen to those people. So there's the range, and then what comes in your ears and what you internalize may not, I mean, from your presentation, it's very clear that you have made a conscious decision to focus on those positive people and the positive messages. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's not always easy or straightforward to do that. Could you speak more sure. about? Sure. I mean, there are times, you know, depending on the type of disability, um, if, if my dyscalculia was even more severe, I think my dissertation chair might have shot me. Right, Max? Um, because we had to sit down and I would take my orange pens and my orange highlighters and my orange gels. And I mean, my dining room table, do you remember this, was covered in paper. And he sat with me for hours and hours and hours on end, putting the numbers in the right places. <laughs> I needed his eyes mm -hmm. to put the numbers properly. And I had that kind of support from my chair. So I, I mean, that was something that I was very fortunate to have and something that was really important that I did have and that was useful for me. Um, I really, um, I mean, I would say, you know, there are different routes to the same success, you know. And in that sense, if your son wants a PhD, there's no reason why your son shouldn't go for a PhD and do it creatively. I mean, I had to get very creative in terms of my dissertation. Go be no. Um, I had to get very creative in terms of how I framed the kinds of um, the kinds of requests that I made um, and how I did them. Like there were some. Uh, I have one uh, fa one faculty member who was on my committee who I know for a fact never read my dissertation. Okay. And I, when I had to ask that person for an accommodation, I knew that I was constantly, yes, Gobi, there's balloons over there. Um, I, I knew that I was constantly going to have to remind him of my situation because he wasn't going to remember, okay? And so there, there are ways around some of the negativity but I, I have to agree with you, yes, there is negativity and there are people that will be naysayers and the, the deal is how badly do you want the degree? And if you want the degree, can you be creative and figure out a way to get it? Max. I'd like to give you a couple of cues. Um, I was struck as you were a graduate student since and how important it seemed to you to give to others. Two, two cues are one, you're working with um, people on the football team. <laughs> and the second one was uh, people who had absolute blocks that couldn't write. Yes. You, you passed on things that really helped. Uh, yes. Like you talked about. Okay. Like giving to others was part of what made you get more. Yeah, giving to others was part of what I did. Um, I spent a lot of time working with the student um, athlete academic support program, uh, working with the football team, basically, on how to pass their classes, how to do their assignments, um, how to um, focus on uh, getting above a C in a class, which was all they thought they had to get. Um, and I, I would spend countless hours tutoring, and tutoring them and showing them different ways of learning. Um, and that was always a challenge and a lot of fun. Um, I worked with all the revenue sports, so I had football, hockey, um, basketball. Um, and some swimmers came to me just because they knew I was a swimmer too. Um, so that was the first part. The second part was that there were also graduate students in my department who, you know, for one reason or another, simply couldn't get past writing blocks as they were writing. And I don't know how many of you guys knew Jim Knox. Okay, he was a dear, dear friend. And Jim introduced me to a wonderful software called Dragon Naturally Speaking. Are you all familiar with Dragon Naturally Speaking? Okay, I love Dragon. 
Because what it means is I can talk to my computer after I train it to my voice, and it types what I say. It's fabulous. I wrote half my dissertation on it. I write many of my papers using it. And then I can go back and edit. And the editing is very minimal. Because if you say period, comma, parentheses, you have to basically talk to it and say what you want it to say. And so that being able to pass those tools on has been able to help other people um, with maybe not learning disabilities, but maybe writer's block or writer's issues. Um, and it helped me especially in terms of describing my statistical trends because I could see them in my head, but what I saw on paper was totally different. Other questions? Are we too well? can't say, they can't tell, right? Um, honestly, I prefer not to use the term disabled. I like the term differently abled. Um, and I say that because I was recently asked to be um, uh, an actual member of the governing body of, uh, uh, what is it, uh, Disability and Society under ASA. And I accepted the position and the entire time throughout the year, I've been getting emails from somebody who graduated from Michigan that I know quite well, talking about, well, I want, to, I want you to talk about your struggles. I want you to talk about what, how hard it is. And I'm like, I don't want to focus on that, right? I want to focus on having my own identity, on, on, on being able to do, on being seen as me in spite of a disability, right? So I, I do wear it as a badge of uh, courage, if you will, as a, as a name tag, as something that is important to me at this point. But it's not, as Goffman would say, my master status. It's only part of who I am. Just like it's only part of who you are. You know, you are an African American man. You are earning your PhD, I believe, right? I'm sorry. MSW. Okay. So. You're going to go out there and change the world, hopefully, just as I'm trying to. And if anybody else asks me if my uh, Chihuahua see seeing dog, seeing eye dog, can help me, um, yeah, that that was a special. Um, <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I wanted to ask. This may take a little more time than you have, but I was curious uh, how to deal with disclosure in job talks and looking at job positions. Um, I have moderate hearing loss, which theoretically could cause problems with uh, 
being able to teach well, but so far I haven't had problems. So I'm curious, kind of, would you recommend disclosing that or not? Or kind of what are the legal uh, kind of things surrounding that? Um, legally, nobody can discriminate against you on the basis of hearing loss. Um, if it were I, I would disclose to the chair of the search committee if I'm being brought in for an on-campus interview or a job talk. And I would also use adaptive technologies um, to show them how easily you can adapt to a classroom situation. And that's how I would do it. So I might use one of the FM adapters or something that might amplify my ability to hear um, in that kind of situation just so that you don't miss anything. But for the most part, it shouldn't, you know, it's, it's completely up to you and I certainly would not make it a, um, the focus of a job application. Yes, ma'am. So, um, my question is about, um, like, again, the, on the theme of the job talk, or job talk, <coughs> job search, or this could even apply to graduate school search. But um, I'm wondering if um, there are any particular red flags that you've noticed along the way, um, and if you could share them with us. Sure, red flags. Um, when I was diagnosed with Crohn's, um, I didn't disclose that right away. And one thing about Crohn's disease is that it can affect you anywhere from your mouth all the way through your digestive tract. It can also affect your joints. Um, it can affect your skin. It can, it's really insidious and horrible, and there's no cure. And so one of the red flags that I should have paid more attention to was when I was up in, uh, in the mountains of North Carolina. I, I was holding a job, and uh, my chair called me in, and he said, you know, I'm really reluctant to renew your contract. And I was like, what? And he said to me, well, yeah, you know, you have an autoimmune disease that has no cure, and I really don't want you exposing the rest of the faculty or the students <laughs> to that. You know, he's like, I see it as akin to having AIDS. And I'm just like, okay, wait a second. One is contagious, one is not. You know, and I had had to ask this gentleman who had turned off the heat in my office to turn the heat back on because my joints were freezing up. And I had had to make a, a request because the Crohn's was getting worse to have um, classrooms near a restroom. Those were the two accommodations I asked for. I had to go all the way up to the provost to get a heater. He stood in my way. So that's a red flag right there. Um, people who are unwilling to even listen to or have a conversation about possible accommodations um, are you know, that's a red flag for you. Um, but in general, what I've found is that, you know, if you ask and if you talk to people honestly and openly, more often than not, they're willing to, to work with you. And if they're not, don't go into that program, don't go to that school. Uh, Gail, I know you need to leave, so I have to give you a hug. accepted me into the program in sociology. I'm so grateful. So, other questions? Stuart, do you have any questions? You already no. know everything. I know, I doubt that. I just wanted to fill part two of my promise, <laughs> which was SAT swag. So, thank you again. Thank you. I'm very appreciative. Thank you. Again,